working. How are we doing? Good? Yeah. We're going to, to get started. Uh, if you were not able to check in for Samar's lecture up on the screen by scanning the QR code, there are some papers with the QR code tapes to the doors behind you all. And there's some also up here on the microphone that you can scan as well. So please make sure that you do so, so you can get credit for whatever classes you are attending um, for attending the Mars lecture. We're doing something different as well for this particular Mars lecture. So you notice the post-its that are in front of you um, to try and encourage questions at the end of the Mars lecture so that it's kind of what some awkward science silence for Bob and for any other future uh, speakers that we have. As Bob is giving his presentation, if you have any questions that you don't want to forget, please jot them down on the post-it. Um, at the end of Bob's presentation, we will also give you some time to jot down the questions, uh, and I will come around and collect them. Right? So if you don't feel comfortable asking a question out loud, uh, we can collect them and, and I can read them off for you. Okay. So if you need a post-it if there's not one on your seat, if there could be, feel free to grab one and we can go from there. There's tens up here as well. If you need one, raise your hand and I can give them to you. Okay. So it's my pleasure. This is our last Mars lecture for the semester. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Fabri, who we decided I am family with. <laughs> we are. We are related in a roundabout way. Through marriage. Through marriage, yes. So I will uh, give a little while for him to properly introduce him. Since 1986, Robert E. Rake has served as president of the Rake Darlington Group, a nationally honored insurance and risk management brokerage firm with offices in Exxon and Reading. Bob has been a director of First Resource Bank since May 2012. He served as a director of National Penn Bank Shares Inc. from 1999. He is a chartered property casualty underwriter, a chartered life underwriter, and a certified insurance counselor. And in 1996, was recognized as the insurance broker of the year in Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Delaware. He also served as the president of the insurance agents and brokers of PA in 2004 through 2005. Bob served as chair of the board for the Chester County Community Foundation and as a strong advocate for this union. At the Community Foundation, Bob has served as chair of the Investment Committee, member of the Finance Committee, a member of the Strategic Initiatives Task Force, and now Director Emeritus. Bob served as a board member on another half dozen nonprofits. Currently, he serves as the Resource and Development Committees of both the Greater Brandywine Y and Good Works team. So please give Bob a round of applause and welcome. <laughs> Well, thank you, Susie. That was very kind of you, even though you're now a family member. I'd like to do a little housekeeping first. Is Diane in the room? Diane, you know who I'm talking about. She didn't make it. Okay. That'll make that simple. Okay. When Marty starts walking towards me, I pay attention, guys. I just, there's no way I'm going to miss that. Um, I truly am delighted to be here today because I'm going to get to share with you something that has helped uh, our company excel and quite honestly has earned me rewards and fulfillment well beyond anything I ever dreamt of while I was here at Elizabethtown. But while I'm talking about fulfillment, I should introduce you to Karen, my wife, She's the woman sitting back up there next to Marty on the, in the back. And this year, Karen and I are celebrating our 40th wedding anniversary. Yeah. Now picture this, guys. 40 years ago, my best man, good buddy, pal, chum of mine, leaned over to my wife during the uh, wedding um, uh, ceremony and handed her a sympathy card. But that wasn't the bad part. The bad part was it was signed by my entire family. And that's the truth. Stuff like that you can't make up. 
Um, with this Mars series that you've had, you've had a great opportunity to listen to a lot of different successful people get up and talk about what they've achieved. And a number of them told you great stories about the companies they work for. And it was quite honestly, I've had the opportunity to listen to probably the vast majority of them. And I will tell you, I found it fascinating. But today, I'd like to take you in a totally different direction. Um, and those that know me uh, probably are not surprised. But I don't think that you really want to hear about the awards that my company had won or the national awards that our, my company had won. And you really don't want to hear about a very introverted kid that was very dyslexic that went to a two-room schoolhouse for the first six years of his education. And my hometown had 250 people in it and 25,000 chickens. Now, no, that, you can't snicker at that. I want you to know that that school got indoor toilets in the fourth grade. I mean, we were cutting edge. True matter, truth, I can't make that stuff up. It was, my hometown was pretty, but that's not what I think you want to, want to hear about, or quite honestly, it could be fairly boring. Um, but it, the issue, the word I'd like to pivot on, if you wouldn't mind, is going back to the word dyslexic. Because uh, an, a number of years ago, a few years ago, I found out that I was dyslexic in every way possible. I don't read like you all read. I can't begin to spell. And quite honestly, uh, when I write, my proofreading isn't good and my writing isn't good. But on top of that, I don't hear or perceive the way that you do when you listen to something. Um, I, closed captions are great, but the only problem is I have a difficult time keeping up with closed captions. It, it, you know, it's a catch-22. Uh, and as you will see in the speech, I don't always speak the way some people speak. Um, when I was a kid, um, I used to try to cover up my dyslexia by humor. And that only frustrated the people that were trying to teach me or trying to coach me or trying to, uh, you know, help me along. And um, they started to use the way to encourage me. They started to use words like, if you don't apply yourself in getting this accomplished, you're going to end up a ditch digger. And the older I got, they started to say phrases like, if you don't apply yourself and get this paper done, you're going to end up in Vietnam. And when I really frustrated them, them come out and say, hey, you know, if you don't apply yourself in this paper, you're going to end up in Vietnam. And remember, Woody Yanks didn't come back. And Woody Yanks was the uh, lone Eagle Scout in our town for a generation. So he was revered immensely. But in retrospect, I know that really all they were trying to achieve was to encourage me to apply myself. Um, but after a period of time, you internalize that and you start to believe it. But gang, when you look around this room or you look at your friends, the majority of us struggle with something whether it be obesity, uh, mental illness, uh, the color of your skin, your sexual preference, your se sexual orientation, there are just tons of things. And I left off one, poverty probably being one of the most cruel. But the question isn't, you know, what do we do about it? The question is, are you going to let the world define who you are? Give me a yes or a no. No. I could do that one more time and get a little more reinforcement here, gang. But no. And I will let you know that my sophomore year here 
after I aced an accounting class or a test, I came to the conclusion that I wasn't going to let the world define who I was. And that was a major change. Now, it is true, 50 years ago, I was here. How many of you dorm or have dormed in Bernzer? Anybody? Oh, a couple of hands. Come on. It's co-ed now? Yeah. Oh, wow. Anyway. Anybody of the few hands who were raised, anybody in Brinzer 1 North? Nobody. Okay. Spent four years in Brinzer 1 North. And, I just, and back then, we had no air conditioning, and some people will debate we had no heating. But that was the way it was. But it wasn't a big deal to me because we didn't have air conditioning at home. We didn't have air conditioning in the car. And let me tell you, when you're a couple hundred feet away from the 25,000 chickens in the summer, air conditioning would have been a big deal. It was just tough to deal with. So, and the only way we had to communicate with the outside world back in those days was the U.S. mail system, or we could go down to the telephone booth at the end of the hallway, and at the end of the hallway, we could talk all we wanted as long as we had some money. Because the long distance telephone calls were extremely expensive and it wasn't used that much. You see, the only local calls were right here in the Elizabethtown area. So as a kid that didn't have too much scratch, this, that, it didn't work. That was the only way we had to communicate. But I will tell you, we had a computer. I had never seen a computer before I'd come to campus. Seen pictures, but I'd never seen one. We had, guys, an IBM, IBM 1130. Now, an IBM 1130 was a little shorter than that table, a little taller, and uh, about twice as wide. And the card reader that went with that IBM 1130 was almost 50% larger than that. Now, card reader, that meant we had to use punch cards to get the computer to be able to, to load our programs into the computer. And the punch cards, best part about it, the punch card machines, where there were three of them, two of them worked the majority of the time, and we went down across campus. Now, the computer was in alpha, and we're calling this Nyer Business Center right next door here. Well, it was the new business building, but the new business building, we did the punch cards. And you carried your punch cards across very, very delicately because if by chance you lost one or you shuffled the cards, it could take you a long time to sort of get everything back in order. And heaven forbid, if you carried it to your, had to, you couldn't get on the computer that night, you had to take it back to your dorm room, guaranteed your roommate or somebody in the hall would pick out a card or two or shuffle a card or two. Now, this wouldn't happen today, would it, Freddie? No, I didn't think so. Of course not. So, but not to worry. My sophomore year, we got a Deck 10 computer. Now, this thing was massive. It took up about half the front of the building. It had its own separate room. It had its own air conditioning system. It was phenomenal. And we had a thing called random access memory. Incredible. This thing was an oversized, there were two of them, oversized washing machine with a lid. And you could lift that lid and grab a deck of four uh, uh, discs and plop it in there. And it could randomly go to any one of those discs anywhere along the way. It was incredible. Picked up speed, and those discs, you, you're going to find this hard to believe, but it held almost an entire book on those four discs. I was just cutting edge and I was delighted. Um, what we walk around with today in our pockets with cell phones is thousands times greater computing. 
than what we had in that deck 10 that I was delighted to work with. One other thing you should be aware, we had a teletype machine. We actually had four teletype machines that you could type directly into the computer, directly into the computer, and it typed out your program as you wrote it right onto the paper. Yep, I was just, I was tickled to death. That was really cutting edge. So at that point, we also, and you, you might find it interesting, I co-opted with accounting, an accounting firm, and then I went to work for an accounting firm later. And it really wasn't until 1984 that I worked with a computer again, nine years later. In 1984, we bought, I, mean, I bought for the company an IBM XT computer remarkable. It was the first time that computers got to an affordable price for small companies, and we bought it. But also in the late, as I graduated from here, what you should be aware of is we worked with, if we wanted a copy, we worked with carbon paper. So you'd put carbon paper between two sheets, put it into the typewriter and type away. Don't be a dyslexic. The, it created such a mess and trying to correct stuff, it was terrible. Carbon paper was the pits. So when it came, they came out with carbonless paper, I was delighted. All of a sudden, we didn't have to work with carbon paper. But the problem that that created was the second copy of the carbonless paper, if you left it in the sun, it would fade and almost fade away. So it wasn't the most effective process. The first copier that I ever worked with or that I purchased for our company, I, I worked, we didn't call them copiers when I got out of school. We call them Xerox machines and you didn't copy paper, you Xerox paper. I mean, it was just, that was the only machine that did it. And they were huge and they generally took a repairman once a week to come in and make sure it was working. It, it, these things were just a disaster, but it was a copy machine. And um, the copy machine that I first purchased for our company took 3M paper and you stretch the th thing over a light bulb. You waited for the 3M paper to heat up. And eventually in three to four minutes in this process, you would have a copy, but not to worry here either because that copy would fade if left in the sun as well. So it was a challenge working with copies. Uh, so in dealing with this, you have to recognize that people's expectation of service and response was just very low and slow. If you waited for a piece of mail to get back to you, to respond to your piece of mail, it could take weeks. And if you want a documentation on the question or you want a documentation later, whether it be for court reasons or whatever, IRS, if you want a documentation, it could take months to produce the documentation. So it would, People's level of expectation was just simply lower when we compare it to today, particularly. So the question then gets to be, where does this whole concept of immediacy, the culture of immediacy come in and how does it apply? And I, would like to go to that, but before we do that, I'm going to ask you to take 30, oh, what you need to know is that there are several studies that say 40% of the people in this room are not going to, are preoccupied with what they've got to get done today and never pick up on what's going on whether it be the fact that you got to pound away on those things right now or whatever, tomorrow 
you're going to have, you got to get this stuff done. What I'd like you to do for a 30 second period is to scratch down what you have to get done. If you didn't bring anything, scratch it on that little blue piece of paper. And if you don't have pens, I've got, I got three, three people here that I dearly love and they have to have pens. I'm not going to do this to you. Okay. Now, for the next 30 seconds, I want you to write down what you've got to get done. And gang, we're going to refer back to it later. So it's important that you get this done. And I'm going to start that now. Do you need a pen? I can throw. I get two. You got two? There you go. Sure thing. We're going to refer to it. So it's important. 15 seconds. Some of you have more to do than others. Okay, we're done. Now do me a favor, guys. You can keep your computers up, or your laptops up. It's almost all laptops. You can keep your laptops or um, iPads up, but turn off your phones. Let's focus in on this. We are going, the fact that you've now identified what you've got to get done, it'll come back to you. You can use it later. And we're going to talk about that later. So to talk about this concept of immediacy, I'd like to talk to you about a story that I have that started me on, on this trail, or at least clarified in my mind, the trail of immediacy. I have a good friend of mine and a client uh, who is named Steve for today's purposes. And Steve called me one day in a panic. You see, one of his best friends had just called him and said, I've got the, an unsolicited offer from my company. It is an incredible price. I've got to do something. I've got to jump at it. But you're my good friend, and we've talked about merging the companies together someday. I'll give you the same the chance to match this price, but the price is only good to the end of the year and it's less than 60 days away. And what you have to understand is my good friend was buying for over 25 years his controllers for his equipment that he manufactured from one guy. And that one guy that he was buying it from was his friend. And they had talked about merging the two companies together for years. And he said, and basically he told me, I, he just can't do it. And I asked why. And he said, well, I, I don't have the time. Right now, uh, we are in the process of manufacturing the largest job we have ever manufactured in the history of the company. It's a huge job and it's very important that we get it done correctly. I get it. I totally understand. He said, on top of that, my bank loan has grown to such a point that now the bank is insisting that I get a certified audit for year end. Well, a, a certified audit was going to tie up his CFO and his accounting department for a lot of time in the next 60 days. And to make matters even worse, Bob, the engineering department is working on a job that is more than twice the size of our current job and could set us up for a long time with a wonderful project. And, I, and he said, to make matters even worse, my oldest daughter is going to get married in the spring. And right now I have got to make a, I've got a lot of things at home that I've got to be involved in and making decisions on. And it was just, it was just a struggle. So I said, Steve, you got to, you know, this, take a breath and let me ask a couple of questions. I said, do you have the right people to make this job work? Can you really do a due diligence or a fact find 
with the people you have on board? And he quickly responded by saying, sure, I do. I have got a great team. These are some of the best people in the country at doing what we do. I said, well, then, Steve, it sort of gets easy. The issue is you have to determine what the priorities that you want to work on. Is this elephant that you want to bid on really that important compared to what you're looking at now? Is there any possibility that your accounting folks can push some of the accounting paperwork on the audit back to the accounting department or back to the accounting firm or the auditing firm? And quite honestly, could the guys on the plant maybe work a little more overtime to make this happen if it were that big a deal? I said, why don't you take some time, get back with your management team and talk over what's important to you and your team? I said, it's a good idea. I'll do that. In less than 48 hours, I got a call back from Steve. And Steve is ecstatic. You know, he's now, he's going, Bob, you're not going to believe this. But he said, I talked to the engineers and the engineers think that this pie in the sky bid that they're working on, they've got less than a 10% chance of hitting on it anyway. This is a much better project to be working on than this huge bid. And he said, even better yet, the engineers have said, that if manufacturing needs some help, or if the guys in the floor, plant floor, need some help, they'll get down and help the guys in the floor. It's a good experience. Any engineers in the room? No. Thank heaven we're all business. Anyway, um, the engineers coming out of their ivory tower, coming down to the floor, that was huge. And he said, the, we've checked with the accounting firm, and the accounting firm is more than happy to help out on this uh, and pick up some of the slack that could be created uh, for the audit. And on top of that, they've got a checklist for the potential fact find that they, get, that they could provide us. And they'd even be willing to help us evaluate the, the uh, company. Well, you know, that was great. I said, Steve, it sounds wonderful, but buddy, the real work's gonna start. And uh, I said, you know, you've got to come up with a clear cut game plan as to what you want to get accomplished over the next 45 days. You've got to be clear uh, in the assignments and who's responsible for it, the timing of that, and, the and you've got to make sure that the deliverables, everybody understands what the deliverables are. And the worst part, Steve, is you can't micromanage your teams while this is all happening. There's too much work. You got too much at home and you can't do it. And I know you love to do it. And he was a great micromanager. It was part of the reason that his company wasn't bigger, but it was also part of the reason that his company was one of the best in the country at doing it because Steve's an absolute genius. So I, he said, I hear you. I said, why don't you take your management team and go back and come up with a game plan and execute it on it. And you be there as a sounding board for the, the various teams. And you be there as a coach to make sure and holding people accountable to make sure that it happens. So he did. 45 days later, they came back with a conclusion everybody was happy with and they relayed it on to his friend. Now, in January, when we sat down, or when Steve and I sat down over an adult beverage, we had this conversation about how things went. Quick question, anybody here want to know what the decision was of the company? Anybody? One, two, okay, we got a few. It's okay, you just got it here. Bottom line. It was really a surprising decision. You see, they had never bid this work in 25 years. 
they had a great relationship. You don't necessarily bid your, your friend out. So for 25 years, they had worked with the same company. When they went out, much to their surprise, they found there were at least two domestic companies that could do this and possibly two to three international companies that would be willing to do it. And they found out it could be done at a much lower price. In addition to that, the engineering and the manufacturing guys took a look at the smaller pieces of controllers that they were purchasing and said, you know, we can do that. That's not that complicated. It's really not that big a deal. And manufacturing and uh, engineering came up with a plan to incorporate the controller just inside of their cabinet and make it even look sleeker, more modern. And they said they charged more for it. I don't know how true that was, but the bottom line was, uh, and the third thing that sort of sealed the deal was they found out or they, they had a supposition that there was some pollution on the site and they just didn't want to buy into that potential pollution problem. So the end of the story, the deal went through for his friend. However, they did find in their due diligence, they found that there was a pollution issue. They reduced the price for the cleanup of the pollution and everybody was happy and won in the end. So I was sitting there with Steve having an adult beverage. Uh, I can say that, can I, Marty? Anyway, I was sitting there with Steve having an adult beverage afterwards. And Steve was really, we were discussing how pleased he was with how the process went. The guys really came together. They buckled down and they really got the job done and they came to the right conclusion, even more importantly. But then he said something that really resonated with me. He says, why can't we work with this kind of immediacy all the time? And it just sort of clicked. We had been developing immediacy in our company for years and here it was, Steve was beginning to get the sensation of what immediacy could do. So I looked at him and said, Steve, you could do it all the time, but you have to change the culture of the company. And since the vast majority of you are all in business, changing the culture of a company sounds easy and I can repeat it, but it is not. It takes time and it's difficult. So this led me to an outline that I worked on with Steve. Um, first point, did Steve have the right people for the, in the bus? He felt so. And in the end, he proved he was right. The right people in the bus. Anybody, does that ring a bell for anybody? Any book, anything? Come on, guys, your business people. You didn't read this book? Shame. We're going to get you to read it. Good to Great by Jim Collins. Great book. I would encourage everybody to read it. And the first thing he talks about is getting the right people on the bus. Well, gang, if you want to learn how to put the right people on the bus, you can start right now by picking the right people to be your friends. If you develop a good habit of picking the right friends, it's amazing. It gets a whole lot easier when you want to pick the right people for the bus in your company, in your team, in your division. You got to do it. Clear and open communication, problems, issues, expectations, goals. Clear and clear communication. I'm not going to, I struggle with that today. Um, Everyone struggles with communication in any kind of relationship. That's no hot flash interpersonal relationships. But in a business, it can be almost impossible. But you have to clearly communicate the issues, the problems, 
the expectations. They had a clear, what are our deliverables? When do they have to be done? Expectations were clear. And the goal was to come to the right decision for his company. And they did. Encourage and keep people on task. Ah. For the guys in this room, I will tell you, keeping people on task was a lot easier for me uh, because of my nature. Encouraging people, I struggled with. I got better, a little better at it with age, but I will tell you, it comes naturally to a lot of, uh, to a lot of women. It just doesn't come naturally to me. And you can be encouragers and you need to be encouragers. And I've had many people in my teams that I look to to help me recognize when I needed to encourage other people. And they were always my female cohorts. Measure what is important. If something is important in what you're trying to achieve, measure it. Make it sure that it is measurable and make sure that those the deliverables include the measurable goals. It's extremely important to measure what you want to achieve. And I will tell you, um, I started throwing our, our um, goals or our, the things that we are measuring on the bulletin board in the team center. Just threw it up at a team center lunchroom. We call it a team center and we had various functions in our lunchroom. But we threw it in the bulletin board then we measured it and we threw the results up on a monthly basis. Um, it's, if you don't measure, it won't happen. Build teamwork at every level, uh, a real cliche. But when we go back to Steve's story, to get the guys in the ivory tower of engineering to come down on the plant floor, floor and actually get them to help in the manufacturing, that was, that was teamwork. They all knew what they wanted to achieve. They knew why they were wanting to, to achieve it. And they all pitched in to get it done. To get that kind of synchronization is very difficult in a team, in a division, in a company. And there are a number of you folks that are going to go back and end up working for the family business. These are important notes. Listen to everyone. Again, can be a real cliche, but I, I listen to everyone. You need to become a good listener. And I would rec recommend you not only listen to your associates and customers, that's simple. The more difficult part is your vendors and your peers. Your vendors are gonna be, have a wealth of knowledge because they work with a number of other companies. And your peers, it's amazing how peers are willing to share information among each other when you show an honest interest. Adapt and be creative. Steve had to adapt tremendously in a very short period of time. The micromanager had to learn to manage and he hadn't done a good job of that up to this point. So he was adaptive and creativity. No one would have guessed when they started out on that project, that they weren't going to be buying a company. They really thought they were going to be buying that company, growing the company by 50% and going on down the road together as they had always joked and thought about for a long period of time. Last one is extremely important. And this is a Bob Rigg favorite. Make your decisions quickly, learn to admit your mistakes and learn to fail. I got failing down at an early age, but I didn't want to make a mistake in other people. I fought hard not to look like a fool in front of other people. So I never wanted to admit a mistake at the beginning of time. Ask my wife, Karen will tell you, I it was very difficult for me to admit a mistake and she'll tell you even today, it's not, I'm not great at it. But in business, when you're, running a team or you're running a division or you're running a company, making a decision quick is good leadership, but even better leadership is admitting that you made the mistake and you need to go in another direction. And you know what? When you demonstrate that to people, 
they will be that much quicker to admit they've made a mistake. And you have to learn not to criticize them for coming to you and telling you that they've made a mistake. A huge, huge issue for you. And learning to fail. Uh, those of you that uh, snowboard or ski, you know, you got to fail a bunch. The only way you're going to get better is failing. I mean, the thing you have to learn is not to be embarrassed by it. When you're snowboarding and skiing, it's sort of expected. When you're leading a team or you're leading a division or you're leading a company, you don't like to admit you failed, but you need to. So what are the results? Quickly. Teams working together, much better. And I know, again, that can be a cliche, but when you've got engineering, do you notice at the end of this, engineering and, and the plant floor came together to say, we can manufacture that small controller unit in-house. That was huge. But really, when teams work together, it is much more efficient. Better job satisfaction. Now, everybody wants job satisfaction. Everyone. Every one of you wants to leave here and feel good about the job they're in. But you do not feel good about the job when management isn't listening to you. When you feel that you're not part of the decision making, that your input doesn't matter, when people aren't listening to you, job satisfaction goes down. And every one of you knows that today, fighting for your associates, fighting to keep somebody on in the company is very, very important. So make them part of the team. Make Everyone feel part of the team. Job satisfaction goes up. Much to, your, my, much to any of our surprise, if you have happier team members, your customers are happier because customers like to deal with happy people. That's a hot flash. But it's extremely important. And remember... We are creating this culture of immediacy. So customers' questions matter. And customers' questions will get answered rapidly. And if they're not answered rapidly, you will be in touch with them as to when you think that answer will be. We have so many great examples today of customer service. Uh, it's it's incredible. And we also have just as many bad examples of customer service out there. Just call your cable telephone, television company. Uh, it leads to smoother operations. The integration of, the, instead of people working in silos, people will work together in integration, which is huge. You really want them to work uh, smoother, and they will work more efficiently that way. And you will get greater desired results. Anybody want to guess what I mean by that? You're not getting off the hook, Alex. What do you think by what I mean by greater results? Take a shot. What's a company looking for? Shoot, go. Higher profits. It's the first thing people think of, and it's logical. Next time I'm going to work on you, Alex. Exactly, higher profits. But that's not where this is. And I'm not trying to be critical. Thank you for answering. But that's only part of it. If you do your job right, and the company is operating more efficiently and better, you can afford to pay your team better. And your goal should be that your team is extremely well paid for what they do. That should be your target because they're working together more efficiently. They're working together as a team. And I was able to put that into an accounting major. I know this is hot flash, but I was able to make that part of our goals to work more efficiently. And I could get the numbers and I could post it on the board. And I could tell people, if we hit this result, this is going to be the average pay increase. This will be the average bonus. It has to be a win, win, win if you want to achieve greater results. 
Okay, here's the big thing. How the heck do I apply this to me individually? Each one of you can go from this room and start to apply these principles today. It doesn't have to be when you graduate. Don't wait, because if you don't apply these principles now, when you go to graduate, you'll be in a learning process. And you don't wanna be in a learning process. When you hit your first employer, you wanna be somebody that's recognized that can be that team leader, that could be that division leader. And the only way you do that is by getting in good practices now. So what do I consider good practices? Well, first, you have to take a look at your abilities, your weakness, and your, and your interests. Now, guys, think about what my abilities personally and my weaknesses were when I sat down to do a critical evaluation. It wasn't encouraging, but I knew I was better with numbers than I was the alphabet. There's only 10 numbers, 10 variables in numbers. There's 26 variables in the alphabet. For a dyslexic, 10 is a whole lot better than 26. And I could check that I had made a mistake. Things have to balance. Debits have to equal Debits have to equal credits. Don't believe I almost forgot that phrase here. Anyway, debits have to equal credits. It's got to balance so I could find my mistakes more readily. So, and I could tackle complicated concepts. I could understand concepts, but I was slower at grasping it and I was slower at being able to explain it. But I could get complicated concepts that others couldn't. So accounting was just a natural for me, and oh, by the way, I had a minor in computer and I loved the minor in computer. Um, and it was learning languages, computer language, computer languages made more sense to me than the English language by far. Again, there were less variables. And I couldn't find my mistakes, but that's a whole nother problem. Um, determine what is important to you. And I will tell you, when I started off, what was important to me was to provide a, an income for me so that I knew I was going to survive. Um, that was my goal. Uh, in addition to that, I had always wanted to go to Australia because I wanted to go to Australia. So those were two of my early goals. Uh, when you prioritize them. Develop a short and long-term plan for your priorities. Now, I, my short, long-term plans were at your age, get a good job, excel at that job, and make a bunch of money. And I had to come up with a game plan as how I was going to work through my senior year, Freddie, and make sure that I had a job when I was coming out my senior year. And you need to make sure that you've got a monthly and literally daily action plan to come up with those long-term goals. I wanted to get to Australia. I was determined I was gonna save $10 a week for that trip to Australia. Nine years later in 1983, I was finally able to get to that trip to Australia. It took time and I had a savings account that I put aside which paid no interest, something like today. And I put my $10 a week when it was left over from maintenance of the car or the beer money that weekend, truthfully. So I tried to have the $10 a week put aside. Communicate better. Gang, this is an underestimated thing. Uh, yes, communicate with everyone better. But communicate with someone that you care about that what your goals are. You need to be held accountable. And I don't care whether that's a, you know, your favorite person. I don't care if it's a coworker. You need to communicate with them what those goals are and you need to be held accountable. We wouldn't know about that, would we, Marty, holding each other accountable? 
So, uh, communication. The last thing on there is celebrate your small and large achievements. Now, I will tell you, my large achievement was being able to save the money to go to the trip to Australia. Yeah, that was a, that was a, and I had a great time celebrating. Um, but it is something I didn't do enough of when I was younger. I didn't reward myself for my achievements. Uh, and I had a difficult time when I got in a position where I was in charge um, of an office and eventually the company. I didn't celebrate the way we should have been celebrating. But as time went on, I got better at it. And I think that I learned a lot in the process. So, gang, that's sort of the, and don't underestimate that last one. You know, uh, Ariel, celebrate. This is something that should not be underestimated. So, I'd like to leave speeches with quotes, and then hopefully it's inspirational and you all carry something forward. I looked over dozens and dozens and dozens of quotes, and I came down to the conclusion that I liked three so much, I was going to give you three quotes at the end, and I want you to pick who said this. Now, today we're going to be working from uh, Jim Cameron, uh, James Cameron, the director. Second quote we're going to be potentially dealing with is Dr. Seuss. Interesting combination. And the third person I'm using is John Lennon. And any of you that don't know John Lennon will be glad to talk afterwards. So I'm going to give you the quote, and it's your responsibility to guess who said it. Okay, first one. I've got a brain in my head. I've got feet in my shoes. I can go in any direction I choose. Hot flash. Come on, Dr. Seuss. Yes. Second one. Life happens when you're busy making plans. Who was that one? Somebody. John Lennon. John Lennon. So typical John. And the last one I'm going to read to you, hopefully, because this is this one I want to make sure I get correct. If you set your goals ridiculously high and it's a failure, you fail above everyone else's successes. James Cameron. And those of you that don't love James Cameron, we can talk at lunch and uh, we'll go from there. Guys, I, life is absolutely great. I would very much want you to go out and live it to its fullest. But don't you dare, don't you dare let the world define you. You define your world. Thank you very much for your time. Anybody have any questions? And it's not a requirement. Yeah. If anybody wants to shout one out, I can also take it on the fly. Okay, Alex, you're not getting off easy. Alex, you're not getting off easy. What was your question? Okay. 
And guys, when you wrote down your list of things that you wanted to get done, it allows you to focus on other things. If you clearly write down what you want to get accomplished, you can focus on the very next item that you're working on. And you can do that every day. My wife comes up with a honey-do list every day for me. It's amazing. And it's true. But that freedom of being clearly defining what it is you want to get accomplished is huge. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, so the uh, big one that we have is how do you bounce back from failure? <laughs> Practice, practice. You know, they say that the average billionaire, the, he used to be a millionaire, but the average billionaire has failed at least in two to three businesses prior to becoming successful. I have a friend of mine that sat on the NatPen board with me, and I should maybe not say it that closely. But I have a friend of mine that sat in a board. You all will not know which board. And he was an extremely successful millionaire. I, I, his products were being sold, are sold today all over the world. But he failed at three. He went bankrupt twice and failed at three companies prior. And his wife, in desperation, started to do something as a hobby to make some money so the family could survive. And when the husband saw how successful this hobby was on the side, he went out and made it a company and made it an international company. So gang, uh, if you fall in your snowboarding or your skiing, you get your ass up and go on. Your ego should not be tied into the failure. And I know that's tough. And I know it's tough, particularly when I was younger. As I got older and I failed so darn much, it got a lot easier. Another question. Do another round of applause. Oh.